Hi, I'm Gavin Giovannoni, and I was uh, asked to actually um, redo my presentation that I gave at the Medical Society of London uh, a week ago. It was uh, entitled Multiple Sclerosis, A Road Less Travelled, with miles to go be before I sleep. And I hope this explains uh, what I'm trying to do with the remainder of my research career in multiple sclerosis. I do have a large number of disclosures simply because I do translational research and the one way to improve the outcome of people's MS is to develop new therapies. And I'm heavily involved with uh, drug development, not only for the commercial sector, but we do a lot of investigator-led studies ourselves. Um, when I went to the Medical Society, uh, I didn't really know much about it, but I found it to be a very impressive institution, and I found the charter online, and the charter was very simple, to give practitioners in the healing art frequent opportunities of meeting together and conferring with each other concerning difficult or uncommon cases which may have occurred, or communicating any new discoveries in medicine which may have been at home or abroad. And so this was the founding principles of the Medical Society of London and actually is the oldest medical society uh, and it is a very impressive institution. One of the things I found by reading about the history of the place was uh, Edward Jenner uh, was a member. And uh, this is actually from this review paper that came out in Postgraduate Journal of Medicine. Um, uh, Jenner's discovery of smallpox vaccination was greeted with incredulity. He had been a corresponding member of the society since 1789, and in 1800 he attended a meeting to present a copy of his seminal work, an inquiry into the cause and effects of the variola vaccina. Letzim and other fellows of the society leapt into action, publicizing Jenner's discovery and leading the battle to rid the world of smallpox. Through the efforts, smallpox vaccine reached North America, France, Australia, India, and beyond. Jenner was awarded a special medal and testimonial in 1802, expressing the society's confidence that great benefit will accrue to the inhabitants of these islands and to mankind in general from the introduction of vaccine inoculation, and that from their own experience, as well as the extensive and successful trials made in various parts of the world, it will, in all probability, ultimately eradicate uh, the smallpox. What's remarkable about this, he presented his work in uh, 1800, and they actually had adopted his discovery by 1802, and they made predictions about what this vaccine will do, uh, which came to bear. Uh, as you probably all know, uh, smallpox has been uh, uh, eradicated, and this shows you the power of vaccines. Uh, and it's quite remarkable. I think uh, in the current era, there are lots of lessons to be learned by the proactive approach of the members of the Medical Society of London. And I suppose the fact that not many people accepted Jenner's discovery initially is uh, well known when anybody d discovers or puts forward a new idea, is that truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed, it's opposed, and then it becomes self-evident. And I think this is exactly what happened to Jenner's discovery of uh, cowpox being a vaccine for smallpox. A similar thing happened with tuberculosis. So Robert Koch, um, a German uh, physician, uh, discovered the mycobacterium that caused uh, tuberculosis, or consumption as it was called back then. And when he presented to his colleagues, nobody would accept it. <clears throat> And uh, so what he had to do, go, do then was develop a theoretical framework to convince his peers that this was the cause of tuberculosis. And that's where the Cox postulates came from. He put forward four different postulates, and they've uh, been very useful uh, in proving that a microorganism causes a disease. Unfortunately, Cox postulates were really um, formulated around bacteria, uh, and then, and the fact that bacteria can also infect not only humans but animals, and so these criteria didn't really apply to uh, host-specific pathogens, and where you couldn't get a, uh, you couldn't infect, for example, uh, an animal. And so this uh, set of postulates breaks down with a lot of viruses that are host-specific, and, and so this is one of the reasons why. <laughs> Cox postulates had to be uh, updated uh, for virology, for example. Um, um, uh, and subsequently, causation theory has evolved, and the 
particular individual that will pick individuals that have done that are Richard Dole and uh, Sir Austin Bradford Hill. So one was an epidemiologist and the other one was a statistician and they discovered that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer. So the first publication came out in 52 and then it ended a series of publications. The next big one is in 54 and then 55. Um, and it took about uh, 10 years for the wider uh, medical community to accept that cigarette smoking caused lung cancer. And I think in 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General uh, included that in their annual report that there was a strong link, a probable causal link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. However, it took up until 1997 for the tobacco industry to capitulate. So you could argue that it took uh, 45 years for eventually causation to be proven and accepted by the wider community. Um, if you're interested in causation and disease, I would urge you to read the uh, Alfred Evans book. The reason why I love this book is because Alfred Evans was the epidemiologist that helped prove that Epstein-Barr virus, which I think causes MS, was linked uh, causally to uh, Burkitt's lymphoma uh, that was typically seen in East Africa. And, uh, and the book is basically a chapter around, you know, numerous different uh, um, causes of certain diseases. And there's lots of uh, information in that book around infectious diseases causing, uh, infectious agents causing disease. Worth a read. <clears throat> anyway, Bradford Hill, um, who, who was a statistician, actually then formulated his criteria for causation. And I would urge everybody who works in medicine or related fields to read the uh, Bradford Hill um, uh, paper, uh, where he's put forward uh, nine different criteria that have to be fulfilled. They don't all have to be fulfilled to prove causation. And I must point out that you know, ticking the boxes here, ticking all these criteria doesn't happen overnight. It takes many, many years and sometimes decades to happen. So causation is not a light switch moment. It doesn't go from, ah, I found the cause. It takes decades usually to prove a cause. And I give uh, examples there. Theodore Bullroth was the person that put forward the hypothesis or the uh, your hypothesis back then that streptococcal infection of the throat caused rheumatic fever. And it took long, I think it took over 50 years for that cause and for the community to accept that. Robert Koch, Mycobacterium TB, Dolan Bradford Hill, cigarette smoking and um, cigarette smoking and uh, lung cancer. Marshall and Warren, this is Helicobacter, an infection of the stomach causing peptic ulcer disease. Um, it took them <laughs> also uh, two decades, eventually won the Nobel Prize for that. Montagna and Sanusi, HIV causes AIDS. Um, that took, I think, when I read the book about the causation there, it took at least 14 and actually maybe even longer to get the wider community to accept that HIV was a cause of AIDS. And then the more recently, Zohazen, so this is a German uh, virologist who put forward that HPV, the human papillomavirus, causes cervical cancer. It took him a long time to convince the wider community. They all thought he was crazy when he brought out this hypothesis. And uh, eventually he won the Nobel Prize. And the HPV vaccine now preventing uh, cervical cancer is the point nine the experimental evidence that uh, an intervention like a vaccine preventing a disease is the final tick for, for proving causation. Um, and I think there's lots of lessons to be learned around the HPV cervical cancer uh, link. Anyway, Going back now to my hypothesis that EBV is the cause of MS, I had an epiphany, um, you know, back in 1999 when I'd just become a, a senior lecturer, just finished my PhD and my training, and I got my first job as a senior lecturer in the UK. I was invited by the MS Society of the UK to attend this meeting uh, on the infectious etiology of multiple sclerosis. It was held in Brighton, uh, and the whole meeting was around uh, a particular paper that came out that chlamydia, you know, an infection that causes um, uh, chlamydia pneumonia in fact, in, uh, the agent that causes a pneumonia uh, was the cause of MS anyway there was a two day meeting and all infectious agents went through viruses and, you know, everything and there was only one that, in my opinion stood out at that meeting there was a presentation by um, uh, a uh, Danish uh, basic scientist uh, 
Sven Ha is his name. He had MS. He was in a wheelchair. He gave the talk, and he highlighted all the epidemiological evidence at that stage linking EBV to MS. And it was pretty pretty clear to me there was only one agent at that meeting that could cause MS or CBV. At the same meeting, Alberto Escheria presented some of the early work he was doing. Um, it wasn't as strong as it is now. Uh, and back in 1999, I was convinced uh, then uh, that EBV was the cause of MS, and we had to disprove that. And I've been working on it ever since, um, sometimes banging my head against the brick wall. But I think we're getting momentum now because, you know, I think more and more people are beginning to accept that EBV may be the cause of MS. And going back to uh, Bradford Hill's causation theory, we have to uh, address all these uh, factors, <clears throat> all these uh, criteria, and see if we can prove that EBV causes multiple sclerosis. Um, I haven't got time to go through all the evidence, but I am convinced that eight of the nine uh, criteria have already been ticked by Epstein-Barr virus, by the association of EBV with MS. And what we're waiting for is the experimental evidence, and that's going to happen in the next uh, decade or two. Now, the other thing uh, that you've got to appreciate is that ideas, hypotheses, facts don't just uh, get accepted uh, overnight, and this is why uh, the Schopenhauer dictum is so important, is that an innovator comes up with the concept, Sven Haar, uh, back in 1999, saying EBV is the cause of MS, so he was the innovator. Um, Alberto Scheria and myself being potentially early adopters, uh, and then wider community accepts us, we get majority adopters, late adopters, and then you'll always get the laggards. Um, and this theory of the diffusion of innovations was put forward by Everett Rogers. Uh, he was actually a sociologist working in the agricultural industry, actually. And he was working on why certain cultures are will adopt agricultural innovations more rapidly than other cultures. And this makes a big difference at a global level, you know, particularly around fertilizers and modern farming techniques. Some uh, countries are, you know, were able to increase the yields dramatically, whereas others were still using archaic farming techniques and, you know, were battling to have food security. And he put forward this uh, the, uh, Diffusion of Innovations is another incredibly important book. Most people who, under, who read this book uh, look at it from a marketing perspective, but uh, it's simply the diffusion of ideas or innovations uh, in, a, in a, what I would call a stakeholder community. I'll put the 30% tipping point then because what's quite uh, well known, at least in the marketing field, is when about a third of the target audience accepts something or adopts something, then you get rapid adoption after that. And I think we are probably not quite there yet with the concept that EBV is the cause of MS. We're probably sitting at around 20% uh, in the early adopter space. You know, so I've been to meetings when I've presented my information and I've asked questions and I, you don't get 100% of hands going up, you get about uh, 10 to 15% of hands going up. But over time, I think we will get adoption. And what drives adoption is more information, more, more proof. This is most important uh, slide that I can present. So this is actually a meta-analysis by Alberto Sheria's group, just showing that the corollary uh, holds. So uh, in my opinion, 100% of MS patients uh, are infected with EBV. But the corollary is if you're not infected with EBV, in other words, if you, if you don't have the virus detectable in your peripheral blood, your chance of getting MS is virtually zero. 0 0.06 is odd ratio. Now, the reason why it's not zero is no assay or no test, even if serology for EBV is 100% perfect. You know, so, so you get false positives and false negatives. So yeah, you may get a false negative. In other words, this person doesn't have EBV. Uh, however, they still get MS. It could be an assay problem, not a biology problem, which is one of the reasons why uh, Julia Pakpur, a young medical student, when we did this analysis uh, in Oxford, um, repeated the meta-analysis in 2013 and shown almost identical results. However, we did a sub-analysis where we only included studies that have the gold standard for detecting EBV. It's called an immunofluorescence microscopy test. And when you do that, there were zero cases of MS that were EBV negative. So I think when you use the diagnostic gold standard, um, uh, that the figure was zero. Uh, so the consequences of that is, well, if you want to prevent MS, you've got to stop people getting Epstein-Barr virus, and that's what's driving uh, the vaccination hypothesis. 
The reason why EBVs become big news was the study done by Alberto Scherer's group using the uh, uh, US military serum biobank. So what happens in US military, everybody who goes into the military has a physical examination and they get blood taken and the serum gets put into a bank and they get that done every two or three years. Uh, so you can get serial samples stored and obviously because they're in the military, they, their medical records get collected and digitized. So you have, so you have serum bank and, and a medical record. Um, and the reason, was, the reason for the serum bank was really for HIV screening. So these people were being screened for uh, infectious diseases every two or three years. So what you can actually then do is go into the uh, database of the US military and find out people who went in well and then develop multiple sclerosis later on. And you can go back to their serum samples and find out whether, where, where they were EBV negative or positive. And, uh, you know, this is a big study because it's over 10 million people in the U.S. military. And the bottom line is that if you were EBV negative when you went into the military and then uh, developed MS later on, you're always converted to uh, becoming EBV positive, except for one case. Um, <clears throat> uh, all the other cases became EBV positive, in other words, exposed to the virus before developing MS. And that's a really important criterion. It's a temporal sequence. You have to be exposed to the causative agent before you develop the disease. Now, that one patient who was EBV negative and then developed MS, there was a nine-month gap. So that it's theoretical that they could have been infected in that nine-month gap between the last serum sample, blood sample, and then developing MS. Or, again, the assays used you know, are, non, are not, maybe not 100% uh, sensitive. So this it could have been a false negative. But the bottom line is it's uh, a really important study. And the virus that they looked at, yeah, <clears throat> uh, the virus that, the, that was looked at, yeah, was CMV, uh, which is a control herpes virus, and there was no association with MS and CMV. Uh, similarly, in the study, they showed that everybody who um, had, sero, had seroconverted and then do to EBV and then MS also had a, a rise in uh, neurofilament levels. Neurofilament levels, as you know, are a, well, a proportion of them had a rise in neurofilament levels. Neurofilament levels are a biomarker of damage to neurons or axons. Uh, and it's like a, what I would call a, a part of the phenotype of MS. So before you develop clinical events like a CIS or primary progressive MS, neurofilament levels went up in the peripheral blood. Uh, but the neurofilament levels only went up after EBV. Um, exposure, not before, suggesting that something was happening in the nervous system before these people developed MS. Uh, so this is really important because we may be able to use neurofilament levels as a surrogate, you know, as a, a marker of uh, CNS damage in people that seroconvert. Very, very important study, and uh, uh, this has now uh, triggered enormous interest. I know Alberto thinks this is final proof it's causal I, I think it's just uh, making the, a very strong case for doing an EBV vaccine another thing in medicine is ugly facts so the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact so this was Thomas Huxley's uh, quote uh, and the ugly fact is when you actually look at pediatric multiple sclerosis you'll see that not everybody has Epstein-Barr virus so this study was from the Canadian cohort published in 2007, and you can see that about 20% of uh, pediatric MS patients do not have EBV. Now, I'm a, I wrote an editorial <laughs> so, um, saying that uh, the EBV negative ones are likely not to have MS, they're likely to have another disease, and I was heavily criticized by the, the pediatricians saying, you know, how dare I uh, uh, criticize their diagnostic skills. And I just simply made the claim that, you know, when we diagnosing MS in children is quite difficult. Uh, and the diagnostic criteria for MS are really not that specific. And it's likely it's other diseases are, are lumped into the MS diagnosis. And uh, I was proved right. Um, almost all those patients, uh, children that were had MS and were EBV negative have turned out to have another disease. They've turned out to have MOGAD, a myelin, myelin oligodendrocyte associated disease. Uh, and so the EBV positives have MS and the EBV negatives have MOGAD. And so uh, I was proven right. And I, uh, I mean, you have to explain dirty facts. And that's the thing about causal theory. If, if there's anything that doesn't fit, you have to actually relook at it in the context of the EBV hypothesis.
Anyway, I put this, uh, and uh, I made this analogy for you to try and explain how it works. As you know, this is the domino effect. So you have a series of dominoes, and we know that uh, genomic factors play a role. And then there are factors that play a role in, in utero. Uh, we think month of birth explains that. Low vitamin D levels, infectious mono, high uh, levels of antibody to EBNA1, which is the um, EBV nuclear antigen, obesity, smoking, uh, being female, all of these are risk factors for developing MS. <clears throat> but the one important thing is, regardless of those risk factors, if you if you stop getting Epstein Barr virus, okay, uh, you can potentially prevent all the dominoes from falling. So EBV is necessary, but not sufficient for someone to develop MS. And I think that's an important concept is, yes, EBV is absolutely critical. Um, uh, and if you don't have Epstein Barr virus, the other factors don't play a role. <clears throat> and um, uh, Alberto Asheria's group put forward this modeling, <laughs> modeling uh, diagram. Uh, and you can see, so uh, late EBV infection, in other words, infectious mono is a really high risk factor. So if you have infectious mono, your risk of getting MS is about two and a half times greater than people who don't get infectious mono. Whereas people who are EBV negative in this dotted line at the bottom, um, the risk is incredibly low and people who have asymptomatic EBV is in between. And so the hypothesis is that if you can actually prevent people becoming EBV positive with primary prevention with the vaccine, you can prevent MS. Uh, and so this is the hypothesis. Let's vaccinate people, stop them getting wild type EBV infection. We'll stop them getting IM. We'll stop them getting an abnormal response, immune response, which we think is linked to autoimmunity. And we'll stop the cascade from forming and we'll reduce the incidence or, or prevent MS in, in, completely. <clears throat> and this is why we need experimental evidence. EBV causes multiple sclerosis. And this is one of the reasons why my university and I was... Um, hopefully responsible for nudging them to do this. Uh, when I moved from my previous institution to my current institution back in 2006, it was to work on Epstein-Barr virus as a causal agent in MS. And it took me uh, more than 10 years to get uh, the epidemiology unit in the preventive medicine unit uh, to actually uh, take me seriously. But anyway, we had this uh, um, workshop uh, on Epstein-Barr virus uh, and MS prevention back in 2017 and was very successful. Um, we had a group of international experts, vaccine experts, and we put forward this uh, white paper. And I'd urge you to read it. It's available online. <laughs> uh, and this triggered us to put a grant application in and my uh, university, well, our charity linked to our university, uh, funded the creation of a preventive uh, neurology unit, which is now a center. That involves three different work streams, but one work stream is targeting uh, multiple sclerosis. So we've had funding put in place and we have a group of people now working on uh, MS prevention. And the clear thing is vaccines. Uh, we're not a vaccine development university. It's a big endeavor. There are some universities that have whole unit institutions to develop vaccines, um, but most vaccine development is occurring in, uh, in, in industry. And the good news is, is there is now a rush to develop an Epstein Barr virus vaccine. Uh, we've had one already from um, uh, GSK, then they then sold a vaccine to Medimmune, and that went quiet. It was a monovalent looking at a protein that's expressed on the surface of um, Epstein Barr virus. Uh, that's potentially been resuscitated. It's a non sterilizing vaccine in the sense that it prevents you getting infectious mono, but it doesn't prevent you getting infected with wild type virus. That may be sufficient, though, to reduce the incidence of MS. And Jeff Cohen's group in the NIH have been working on various vaccines. They've got a monovalent GP350. They've got the bivalent and trivalent. And these the, two, the monovalent and bivalent are now in um, uh, for phase one and hopefully going into phase two very, very soon. And if they're positive in phase two, in other words, they prevent IM in a, um, in a, a proof of concept study, the vaccine will hopefully be sold off to or given out to a pharma company to develop further. Then uh, Moderna, as you know, they developed the COVID, one of the COVID-19 uh, vaccines um, or, or uh, uh, developed a pentavalent vaccine targeting multiple antigens in EBV. And this is in phase one safety and, and will be going forward as a, a preventative vaccine uh, to prevent IM uh, in the near future. 
and they're also developing a therapeutic vaccine and there's a large number of other companies uh, that are potentially developing EBV vaccines. So it's good news. Um, the, my biggest worry though is the adoption of the vaccine. Now there are two strategies. You can either target high risk people, so people that are at high risk of getting MS. The problem with that is most people are sero seroconvert quite uh, early in life. And I think the general population would be reluctant to vaccinate uh, infants with a, a new vaccine. Uh, and therefore, um, the high risk <laughs> cohort is very difficult to get because by the time they are at an age where they can actually consent themselves or the risks are lower in, in terms of potential side effects or adverse events from the vaccine, too many of them are really seroconverted. And so it's you know, we've done the figures and it's almost impossible to power up a high-risk study. And also, if you do an infant study, even, you know, MS, the average age of onset is 30. So if you vaccinate people now when they are infants, the study will take, you know, 25 or 30 years to deliver an answer. And that's not feasible in the in the great, uh, great scheme of developing a, a commercial vaccine. You can't wait 30 years for the experiment to happen. You've got to get a vaccine first and then see what happens. Anyway, the, the, the primary outcome, I think, for uh, an EBV vaccine should be to see if it prevents infectious mono. Um, <clears throat> um, now, the problem we have with infectious mononucleosis, uh, about a third of the population gets infectious mono, particularly in, in high-income uh, countries. They typically develop it when they start kissing. It usually happens in adolescence or early adulthood. Uh, and the problem is our medical textbooks have always put down IM as being a benign, self-limiting viral infection. It's not correct. Uh, in my personal experience from seeing you know, family, friends, uh, colleagues, children get IM, it's a very disabling condition. You know, a large number of people develop quite significant post-viral fatigue from it. And if you're a student, you often have to repeat the year. If you're an athlete, you can't train. If you're in the military, you can't do physical training. So you have to wait at least three months after IM uh, um, because of the risk of splenic rupture. IM causes a spleen to enlarge, and splenic rupture is one of the side effects or adverse events that can occur. Uh, there's also significant mortality. We've had in the UK every year people dying from ruptured spleens and hepatitis as associated with uh, infectious mono. And so I think we can make an argument that the morbidity and mortality associated with EBV in terms of, I mean, with IM from EBV is sufficient to, to justify a vaccine. And then what happens is you get a vaccine licensed and you look downstream to see what happens to uh, other diseases that are potentially caused by EBV. What I've also noticed, uh, and this is particularly a problem since COVID, is that IM is often misdiagnosed. Uh, like people come in with a sore throat. It looks like they might have a bacteria. Uh, more than half our patients in our hospital get given inappropriate antibiotics for, EV, for uh, infectious mono when it's a virus. Um, uh, and so we probably need to improve our uh, diagnostic pathway for uh, IM and possibly need point of care diagnostics so we can make a decision whether this is a bacterial infection or a viral infection so we can manage it appropriately. Anyway, we've actually, we actually feel, I'm not saying we, the world we, it's myself and a group of experts feel that the best way to test the EBV hypothesis causing MS is actually to get a vaccine licensed for the general population to prevent infectious mono. And the idea would be to piggyback the vaccine onto the HPV vaccine, which happens now in girls and boys at 12 and 13 years of age. And then to register those people in a national register and see what happens downstream. Uh, now, there'll be people who won't want to be vaccinated because we know about vaccine hesitancy. And so they'll be like the, the control. And our, our current recommendation is not to test whether these patients have seroconverted or not. In other words, have EBV, just all comers get the vaccine. So if you already had EBV exposure in the past and you get given a vaccine, all that will do is boost your immunity to the virus. If you haven't seen EBV and now you get vaccinated, hopefully it'll protect you from getting infectious mono and the unvaccinated people will act as a control. And then you follow these people up with uh, annual monitoring. You can do that digitally. Uh, and then you see what happens to the incidence of MS uh, and other autoimmune diseases associated with EBV, like lupus, Sjogren's, palmi bilirubin cirrhosis. 
and then also all the cancers linked to EBV, Hodgkin's disease, other lymphomas. Um, and the hypothesis would be that in the unvaccinated population, the incidence will remain, of these diseases will remain high. And in the EBV negative vaccinated population, the incidence will be very low. And in the vaccinated EBV positive, we don't know. They may be lower because by boosting your immune response to EBV, you may be able to control the virus better. And that may also you know, limit it causing autoimmunity, for example. So that's an unknown question what will happen in the previously exposed EBV population that gets revax, gets vaccinated and have their immunity boosted. <clears throat> anyway, we've done power calculations and my colleague Gary Cutter, who's an MS statistician, assuming the incidence of MS is 7.5 per 100,000, that may be an underestimate, but if you want to reduce the incidence down to 2.5 by a ratio, um, uh, 2.5 is reduced by 60, 60 to two thirds, and you want to have a ratio of three to one in, in terms of the control versus uh, active groups, uh, you need about 80, 210,000 EBV negatives to, for 80% for power and over about 300,000 for 90% power. Uh, and, and when you actually know that about 80% of the population may be seropositive at this age, that means you need about a 1.5 million people in this uh, you know, long-term follow-up study. And that's why this has to be an interna international effort. I don't think any one country uh, can do this alone. And this is why we have to put together a, an international consortium to do the vaccine trial. Anyway, this is work done by our group. Uh, uh, my colleague, Ruth, Professor Ruth Dobson, uh, uh, was the lead investigator on this. And Ashwin Curry was a medical student, if I remember correctly, when he did this. Just showing you that in the UK, the uh, by the age of... Uh, in the epoch between 10 and 15, about 80% of people have seroconverted to be an EBV positive already. If you look at these, this graph, you can see that females are much higher than males. And the reason for that is females start kissing uh, earlier than males. And the, and the uh, infectious mono peak is, a, is three years earlier. It's, I think, remember correctly, it's 13 for girls and it's 16 for boys. And that three year gap, by the way, for IM mirrors itself when it comes to the onset of MS. So women develop MS at around 29, and men at about 32, there's a three-year gap. That's another little bit of tr uh, circumstantial trivia, but the IM gap of three years mirrors the, uh, is the uh, uh, onset of MS, symptomatic onset of MS by three years. The reason why I put this up is that if we're going to do a vaccine program, piggybacked onto HPV, a significant proportion of the pop population will be uh, EBV, EBV positive already. <clears throat> I don't think that matters because at the end of the day, you want to prevent infectious mono. So if somebody's already seroconverted to becoming EBV, their risk of getting MS is there, but it's not as high as if they're developing IM. So the whole purpose of this is to give all comers the vaccine. <clears throat> now, I've already hinted to you that people who are EBV positive already and get vaccinated with a vaccine, it may help. Uh, and one of the theories is that people with multiple sclerosis have a problem controlling Epstein-Barr virus. So it goes through latent lytic cycling very rapidly. And this results in a dysregulated uh, immunity. And that may be the underlying pathogenesis of the autoimmunity that's linked to Epstein-Barr virus, not only MS, but lupus and the other diseases as well. So by vaccinating people and boosting the immunity, you may be able to control the virus better and the analogy here is the Shingrix vaccine for the chickenpox or varicella zoster virus. Uh, and this vaccine is now licensed for adults. Uh, you know, everybody over the age of 50 should get this vaccine. And people going on to immunosuppression to get this vaccine because it boosts your immune response and prevents you from getting shingles. And we think the same thing may happen with EBV. By boosting your EBV, your immunity to Epstein-Barr virus, you may prevent it from being uh, active and you may reduce the incidence of MS as well. So there are, t there are many reasons for uh, testing uh, an EBV vaccine to prevent IM or reduce the incidence of IM in all comers, regardless of whether or not they've got Epstein-Barr virus or not. Anyway, this um, <laughs> hypothesis is, an, uh, is out there, and let's hope the wider community adopt it. Uh, and we can only do this registry study if uh, an EBV vaccine gets licensed to prevent IM. And so that's what we're hoping for, that these pharmaceutical companies that have got vaccine programs 
get a vaccine licensed and then the countries uh, pay for the vaccine at a population level. This has to be done at a population level. And so this is one of the reasons why we have to nudge our healthcare, uh, particularly our public health officials, and that if an EBV vaccine is developed, that we get the country to adopt it uh, to prevent autoimmunity like MS and to prevent uh, various cancers. And I must point out that EBV is linked to about 2% of human cancers. So the, the uh, advantages of an EBV vaccine go way beyond IM. Uh, they, they could also have major impacts on a whole lot of other diseases as well. So it's all exciting times. <clears throat> and so when we took, once, once we've done this registry study and we showed that in the people that have had the vaccine, the incidence is reduced, then, then uh, experimental evidence will be there and we will be able to say definitively EBV causes multiple sclerosis. And I hope I see this in my lifetime. Uh, I'm 60 years of age now. Uh, and this, this is a 15 to 20 year experiment. So I may still be alive when we finally can say Epstein-Barr viruses causes MS when the study results come in. Anyway, I've put forward this um, diagram in a review paper, uh, 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 well, an editorial I wrote back in uh, December 2022, uh, explaining that Epstein-Barr virus is an important treatment target, not only to prevent MS, but maybe to treat MS. So there's lots of circumstantial evidence that people with multiple sclerosis can't control the virus, and it's going through persistent e uh, latent lytic cycling. It's a herpes virus, therefore it's got two forms. It's got a lytic cycle where the virus is infectious and it's got a latent where it becomes dormant and lives inside our nuclear genomes, uh, attached to the chromosomes in B cells and it's memory B cells. So, we, so um, there is a compelling evidence not only to prevent MS by vaccinating people, um, but also to try and treat MS by treating, using antivirals or, or therapies that actually try and purge the uh, the B cell compartment uh, of the virus. Um, so there's also this parallel um, strand going forward. And if this par parallel strand works, in other words, an EBV specific antiviral is able to treat multiple sclerosis, my goodness, that would also be proof that EBV causes MS, regardless of the vaccine uh, studies. So there are, two, there are two prongs here, prevention and treatment. I don't have time to go through this, but um, there are lots of issues around designing trials to test antivirals. Uh, you know, do you need to tell, target both latent and lytic infection? Do you have to target both the peripheral and the central nervous system? Do you do it as an add-on, a combination? What biomarkers you use to monitor the effect of these uh, antivirals? Uh, you know, and uh, uh, can you use existing antivirals or you need new ones? There's a whole lot of issues, and this is a complex talk, uh, uh, set of questions, and I try to address this in a review paper I wrote recently, and I've got a much bigger review paper that I will be putting out on the, the, theoret the theoretical issues around the, the, the designing appropriate EBV antiviral trials. Um, now, the reason why this is important is because a colleague of mine came to do a sabbatical uh, in, in London. He's an HIV clinician working in Sydney, uh, Julian Gold. And he said to me, Gavin, I've got this patient that was referred to me by my colleague who was an MS physician in Sydney. And he had quite bad MS uh, and was uh, put on to, I think if I remember correctly, was on interferon beta. Uh, and then he seroconverted and became, he, uh, he seroconverted and became HIV positive. And he was referred to my colleague, Julian, uh, to go on antiretrovirals for HIV. Uh, and when he went on to his antiretrovirals for HIV, his MS went into remission and he stopped all treatment and he had a symptomatic improvement across his MS. So I said to him, this is really interesting. You know, uh, you know, a single swallow doesn't make a summer, but let's put this out there as a case report of an example of a patient who has pretty active MS, not responding to DNTs, going on to highly active antiretrovirals and the MS going into remission. And once we published this case, there was a whole series of um, other case reports that come out. And we've had, you know, people email us, you know, per, giving them some personal stories. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we, unfortunately, we can't publish uh, email evidence, but um, I would say we've got uh, and at least another 10 uh, individual stories of MS going into remission on highly active antiretrovirals. 
So this is really an interesting story. Uh, and that led us to start thinking, can we test this epidemiologically? Uh, and so we went off to um, the epidemiology unit in Oxford, uh, and Michael Goldacre was running it at the time, and we asked him, can we use the NHS data uh, to test whether or not HIV or the treatment of HIV uh, can treat MS? Uh, and so there's a database called the Hospital Episode Statistics, and you can link it to the HIV database. And we found that... Uh, <clears throat> People who have HIV have a marked reduction, uh, almost a 70% or 60% reduction in the risk of getting MS. We didn't know this at the time, but the, but the Danes, um, Vita Stewart in, in Denmark, they showed much the same, but it wasn't significant because the population in Denmark is much smaller than the UK. But there was a strong trend in Denmark of people with HIV having a lower risk of developing MS. Now, we don't think it's HIV because prior to the development of antiretroviral therapy, treatments for HIV, there was a big literature of people having comorbid disease, HIV and uh, MS. So we actually think that this phenomenon is due to antiretrovirals. <laughs> anyway, that le led us to try and shop around. Um, uh, and we went to all the companies that make antiretrovirals, trying to get them to do a trial of, of heart in MS, and we couldn't get anybody to do it. The only company that and they have a drug called Raltegravir, and we did a monotherapy trial. This is, this is a single agent antiretroviral in MS, and our trial was negative. But this agent actually works by preventing the virus integrating into the genome. So this is, a, this is an integrase inhibitor. And that's down, we think that's downstream uh, of uh, Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and so in retrospect, we should probably have said, no, we want to do a, a trial of heart, you know, a combination therapy. Anyway, just to say to you that this data um, is not, this has been now been uh, reproduced. So the Canadian and Sweden have shown exactly the same thing. In HIV population, the risk of developing MS is reduced. And I'm aware of two other data sets in the United States, one from Kaiser Permanente, a HMO in California, also showing that the HIV population in their database have a reduced incidence of MS. And we've also had preliminary data from the VA in America showing the same thing. So we think this is a, a robust finding that having HIV and, and probably being on antiretroviral therapy uh, reduces your risk of getting MS. And that could, that could be a treatment effect. Uh, by the way, when you develop MS for the first time and get your first clinical attack, you probably had MS about 10 years before that. So, the, so these antiretrovirals may be working in the, in the so-called asymptomatic phase of the disease and preventing you getting your first attack or developing a clinical isolated syndrome, as we call it. <clears throat> now, I've already mentioned to you the, in terms of prevention, the attention has been on reducing or preventing you getting uh, IM, but there's also this factor. So just reducing or, um, or treating IM may, may reduce the risk of getting MS. So the, the question is, you know, can we target infectious mononucleosis? Uh, and so this is why I'm going to be taking a... Uh, a long sabbatical from clinical work. So I'm going to hang up my neurology uh, <laughs> hat um, and I'm not going to see patients for at least a year. And I'm going to hopefully set up a pilot um, study to see if we can recruit people with acute, acute IM. And the reason why I want to do this is because infectious mononucleosis is not managed very well, uh, simply because there's no evidence base. And it falls across various disciplines. So the people who see IM are often accident, accident and emergency people, general practitioners, now pharmacists are seeing them. Um, and so there is no one care pathway. So can we actually use modern technology like the platforms that were put in place for SARS, you know, SARS-CoV-2 with COVID? Um, <clears throat> can we use those platforms uh, to create a rapid diagnostic pathway for uh, parallel and pharyngitis uh, and find people with infectious mononucleosis acutely and then put them in trials to develop new treatments for that, in other words, antivirals. Um, and if we can do that, maybe developing a drug to treat IM will change the way we manage uh, and that alone may actually prevent the immune response uh, that occurs uh, in IM uh, which may trigger multiple sclerosis. So what you've got to realize is IM is actually um, 
infection mononucleosis is actually the what causes it is the, obviously the virus, but it's the immune response to the virus that causes the syndrome. So the big tonsils, the big spleen, uh, the big lymph nodes, the temperature, the, the, the that's all driven by the immune response to the virus. So if we can actually put on put in antivirals and reduce the viral load, maybe we can prevent that immune response. In other words, shorten the uh, IM, uh, and then whatever happens randomly in that to trigger autoimmunity might not happen. So the question I'm putting forward, I actually hypothesize that if we had an effective treatment for IM, we will prevent autoimmunity, we'll prevent MS. And the analogy here is streptococcal sore throats. So we know that the bacteria that causes streptococcal sore throats is probably the most potent trigger of autoimmune disease we have. And linked to streptococcal sore throats is rheumatic fever, uh, rheumatic heart disease, Sydenham's chorea, or St. Vitus dance, as some people know it, you get post-infectious laminonephritis, you get skin autoimmunity, um, you get joint autoimmunity. So there are large numbers of autoimmune diseases triggered by streptococcal infection. And it's been established that if you treat streptococcal infection with antibiotics, you prevent them from happening. And this is why it's really important when you do develop a parent pharyngitis is if it is streptococcus, you need to treat it uh, to prevent those secondary autoimmune complications. And I think this is the the paradigm I'm trying to put forward is if we treat IM, okay, we may reduce the secondary sequelae. Uh, and it may also apply to malignancies. Uh, you know, what, hap what happens in IM, which is a risk factor for Hodgkin's disease, for example, um, may be similar. If you prevent or treat IM, <clears throat> you may prevent Hodgkin's disease. So this is uh, an important study. So um, what I want to do with the remainder of my career is obviously be involved in uh, EBV vaccine studies, but that's going to happen anyway. Um, you know, that'll be led by industry, but I would love industry to help me develop therapies for uh, acute infectious mononucleosis due to EBV. Uh, and so what, you know, back in 2000, when I had my epiphany, you know, you know, people poo-pooed this concept that EBV was the cause. So when Sven Haar put it up there, he didn't get much attention. You know, it was just one of the viruses it looked at. Um, I think it's now accepted uh, that EBV is definitely strongly associated with MS, and there's a good 15 to 20% of the MS community thinks that it causes MS. Um, and so uh, if we can show that EBV improve it, then eventually we'll be able to potentially prevent uh, or at least markedly reduce the incidence of um, multiple sclerosis. And the analogy being Jenner with his smallpox vaccine, his, his cowpox vaccine. Uh, and the other uh, analogy is the HPV vaccine preventing cervical cancer. And I'm prepared to bet you uh, if anybody wants to take a long-term bet on this, that a, an effective Epstein-Barr virus vaccine that doesn't have to prevent, in other words, be sterilizing, it, it just has to prevent IM, infectious mono, will significantly reduce uh, the incidence of multiple sclerosis. That's my prediction. Now, the problem we have is uh, vaccine hesitancy. So I got this in my email. I, I uh, subscribe to change.org. It's a uh, organization that puts in petitions to parliament and this one came to me um, about a woman in scotland whose daughter uh, developed cervical cancer and by the time she was diagnosed it was, was disseminated it was terminal and she was 22 and the reason why uh, that this petition is to actually develop um cervical screening program that start much earlier than 25 which is the current age in the uk this woman wants cancer screening to start much earlier I didn't, I didn't sign this petition um, because I, uh, the immediate question I asked, you know, was this young woman vaccinated against HPV? I mean, the best way to prevent this from happening is vaccines. Anyway, I did email um, this, poor, this poor lady's uh, mother asking if she had been vaccinated because she'd be in the right cohort. Uh, she's 22 now and she would definitely be in the uh, right cohort. If I remember correctly, the 1996 birth cohort in terms of women, were the first uh, girls to be vaccinated against HPV in, in Britain. So she would have been in the HPV code. Maybe she would have been in the first generation vaccines, which is Gardasil 4, that only covered four strains. We now have Gardasil 9, which is polyvalent, covers nine strains. 
which is about 97 to 98% of the cancer causing strain. So this particular young lady may have had the vaccine, which wasn't 100% protective and she was exposed to another strain and then developed cancer. But the but the message I want to get across here is HPV prevents cervical cancer. So hopefully this will not happen to anybody else in the future if they get vaccinated. Uh, and I put this up because uh, I don't know if you're aware, there was a, you know, a hysterical phenomenon in Japan where people, uh, the young girls were getting all these side effects to the HPV vaccine. And as a result of that, the, uh, the, the Chinese authorities actually suspended um, vaccination compulsory vaccination of HPV in Japan. And the consequences have been enormous. You know, so this study was done up until uh, 2020, I think it was up until 2020. And at that stage, uh, uh, really because of Japan's suspension of the HPV vaccine, there were about 22,000 cases of cervical cancer and about 5,500 deaths from cervical cancer, uh, which is a great tragedy. Uh, you know, and even though that uh, Japan has now reintroduced the vaccine, there's so much skepticism in Japan that the uptake is incredibly low. If I remember correctly, the uptake is under 30%. And you need to get an uptake much higher than that if you want to get herd immunity to, uh, and eliminate the virus from the population. Uh, and so there's a wonderful um, re review paper here just showing you uh, what's happened in Japan. You know, instead of being able to prevent cervical cancers over time with this orange bar, we're now, we're now having a very high incidence still of HPV infection, cervical cancer, and mortality in Japan because of vaccine hesitancy. And compare this to what's happened in the UK, and you begin to realize, you know, what a difference, uh, you know, government policy has on vaccine uptake. <clears throat> um, and I say this is because... We have the same problem in, in, in high-income countries. This is UK figures showing you that we have an epidemic of measles. Now, we've had, we've had a mumps, measles, and rubella vaccine program for decades. Uh, I got vaccinated against mumps, measles, and rubella when I was a child. Um, and because of the vaccine hesitancy, we're now getting people not vaccinating. And the vaccine rate in London, for example, has dropped below 90%. And that's why we're getting people now coming forward with measles infection. And anybody who uh, has seen cases of measles will realize it's not a disease you'd want your child to get. Uh, and there's also a, a risk of the measles virus mutating uh, and developing and, and causing this condition called subacute sclerosis and pain encephalitis. And you get a mutant strain of the measles that infects the brain and it's lethal. Uh, these patients die from SSPE. And when I was a medical student in South Africa, uh, I saw lots of SSPE because we had a really poor vaccine program in, in, in South Africa. And we, we would see, actually, when I used to go to one of our uh, hospitals in Johannesburg called the Baraguanath Hospital, now the Chris Harney Hospital, doesn't matter when you actually went to the neurology wards there, they would almost always have one case, maybe two cases of kids with SSPE. I say kids are you normally adolescents. And that's a, if you've seen one case of SSPE, you'll, you'll tell any parent you've got to prevent your child getting measles you can't uh, and the other risk about this is is some people can't have because the, va the vaccine's live some people who have immune deficiency syndromes can't get the vaccine so you they rely on herd immunity so if herd immunity drops you're exposing all these high risk children who can't have the vaccine to getting measles and uh, so there's also not just the responsibility to yourself or your children, but to the society in terms of uh, vaccines. And I, I, I think this is a great, great tragedy. We have a doctor to blame. Uh, I'm not saying the medical profession is free. So you all know about Andrew Wakefield, who put forward that MMR caused autism. And he's still, he's now living in America. He's been struck off the General Medical Council register for his paper. They think it's fraudulent. Uh, but he's still putting forward this flawed concept which has been disproven by many people in the field that MMR is a safe vaccine and does not cause autism. There are lots of people who will not allow their kids to be vaccinated against MMR. Great tragedy. So I concluded my talk with uh, my favorite poet Robert Frost uh, and there are two uh, poems that I love, Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening and you can see 
Um, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, and I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. And I mean that I have lots of work still to do. And this is one of the reasons why I'm stopping doing clinical neurology uh, full time. I still see patients as part of research, but I'm not going to be doing routine NHS work at least for a year and possibly longer so I can focus on preventing MS. And then the road not taken, uh, you look at the final uh, the final paragraph there. Uh, I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less travel by, and that has made all the difference. So I'm going to diverge and take another path for the rest of my career um, and hopefully develop a therapy, an antiviral treatment for infectious mono with the aim that if that gets adopted at a population level and reduce, it'll reduce the incidence of multiple sclerosis and hopefully other autoimmune diseases and potentially some EBV associated cancers. Um, but to do that, I need a, uh, a, a really functioning diagnostic pathway for the rapid detection uh, and diagnosis of infectious one. I'd like to acknowledge all the people that have worked with me around EBV and MS uh, and are still working with me. Uh, and the funders that have come forward to help fund our research. It's been a real battle getting a, getting funding. Um, and I'm hoping now with the latest data that's come out, the funders will be more generous with giving out their money. Thank you very much.